Okay, well, good morning, everybody. It's nice to see you all. Um, I'm Kathy Bennett with Justice and Mental Health Organization. Um, we also have as presenters, Brian Wellwood and Shelley Olson. We all work for Justice and Mental Health. Um, and it's, again, thank you all for joining us. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and get started because we have a lot on our plate this morning. Um, Shelly's gonna go ahead and get us started. So if you have any questions or any comments, just feel free to jump in and join us. This is a really interactive presentation. So just feel free to jump in. Okay, I'm Shelly. Nice to have everybody here. We're going to talk a little bit about the difference of the types of groups that they are. There are primarily three types of group. Um, support group is useful in helping people understand that they are not alone in dealing with an issue. A self-help group helps people find the courage to change the path that they have been treading on and make different changes. And finally, an enrichment group is about finding the joy in life and having fun once again. And the thing you got to know is you are not alone. The first type of group we're going to talk about is a self-help group. Self-help groups help people develop boundaries, learn new behaviors, realize natural consequences to their actions learn responsibility, learn new skills, learn about personal accountability and mutual support. And not that terribly different from a self-help group is a support group. With a support group, you have mutual support, you find friendship, you experience healing, you learn that you're not alone. You have camaraderie, socialization. And finally, you have acceptance. And then the most, probably the most fun group to have are your enrichment groups. Those teach life skills. People find joy, creativity beauty, mutual support, fun, and celebration. Can, so, can, go ahead, Kathy. So some of those, um, the different types of um, groups, a self-help group would be more along the line of your AA groups and your NA groups, those types of groups. Um, a support group would be more like um, a depression support group. And an enrichment group is more like a, a book club or a fishing group or some type of group where you just get together and you don't talk about your, your, your mental health or your problems. It's just you get together and you have fun and you you laugh and you talk you really talk about your life and one of the more popular groups we have here at Jim Ho is our director takes people down to the river and takes them fishing when they go fishing they don't talk about their mental health they just get together to go fishing and have a good time going fishing. Can anybody think of any fun enrichment type groups? I don't know, maybe a bowling league? Absolutely. We do that every fourth Friday, I think, where they take uh, people to the bowling alley and they get pop, they get pizza and they bowl, I think three games. And it's very, very popular. Um, Kelly, I'm not sure what you mean by um, where does the peer mentor fall into the group? Um, 
could you explain what you mean by that? I'm going through a peer mentor internship through my STEP program, and I'm trying to get one-on-ones to do my internship hours that I need. Because I took the peer mentor training one-on-one last year with the Michigan Demental Disabilities Council. Uh huh. So I'm just trying to figure out if it's with so help, self-help support group or enrichment? Well, I, I would think being a peer mentor, you could easily use your skills in any one of these three types of groups. Um, probably though it would be more of, I would think more of a support group or, uh, well, actually any one of the, the three groups you could uh, use being a peer mentor in any one of the three groups. Um, Can I say something? Sure. I'm a peer. I'm a certified peer mentor from Oakland County, and I find myself bouncing in between all of these groups, like you said. Mm -hmm. um, but mostly, depending on what the goal is, it might be a supportive. But if they need help learning how to advocate for themselves. I would say that that would fall more under the self-help to help self -help. them learning right. how to do it. But then I also have people that I work with with like social skills, just to get them to get used to talking to people and feeling comfortable opening up. And I find that to be under more of the arrangement group, but mm -hmm. it's also part of the self-help or part of the support group. So I kind of find myself falling in between all those as a peer mentor. And I hope that helps answer your question. Great answer, Matt. Thanks for your, uh, thanks for your advisement there. Matt, great, Matt brings up a great point. You may, your group may or may not fall into one or more of these types. Is that true, Kathy? I think that's true. I mean, um, most, I, I think groups can be really fluid and you're going to find that most groups kind of fit all three types of things. Um, you're going to find that a support group may, you may find that people are developing their boundaries in a support group. Um, you may find that they're learning about life skills in a self-help group. So these are really kind of loose definitions of groups and fit all three types of groups. Um, so don't, these aren't really strict definitions of individual groups or more characteristics of what we have found over the past 15 years of working with groups, but they fit all the types of groups. Um, they're just really kind of loose definitions of, of what we've found for those three types of groups. So don't try to pigeonhole groups into one you know, self-help groups, this is a this is the definition of what a self-help group is. Um, it's not because a self-help group is all about mutual support and it's all about enriching lives. Um, so they, they all kind of overflow into each other. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Moving ahead. What are the reasons that you have a support group? Like we said, camaraderie, friendship, socialization. It can be a place where you can find hope. Other people can inspire you. You can learn to be accountable for your actions. You can be responsible for yourself and you can find that responsibility. You can find authenticity. You can be true to yourself. A beginning and an ending. 
Again, socialization, shared experiences. You might not be the only one going through what you're going through. Mutual support. People are there for you. It's a safe place to go, both physically and emotionally. It's a place to find meaning. Places where you can find new ways to live your life. Some groups have structure and that structure can be helpful. A place to learn how to live. A place of learning to be yourself again. And finally, fun. Can anybody think of any other reasons why support groups are helpful? Hi, my name is Tony. I'm a peer support and a, a recovery coach here at Central City. Um, I find it to be um, for some people just knowing that it's other people out here that's just like you. Yeah. You know, you find that out when you're in these groups that I'm not alone. Like it's people that experiencing the same issues or have the same feelings as I do. So I think that that, that is a big thing. And how powerful is that, Tony? Um, it's very powerful because it gives you hope to know that um, that you can you can get better and just knowing that it's somebody out there that can that can walk the walk with you. Right, right. We have a comment uh, from uh, Ms. Hawkins that says, "Not recovering alone. People need those connections um, that we are not alone. It's huge when we realize we're not alone." So. Absolutely huge. Um, we're gonna move into a little bit of talk about body language because body language is really, really huge when it comes to support groups and how we as facilitators present ourselves and how we read body language in a support group is really, really important. Um, so we're just gonna touch briefly on that. 7% um, of what people notice is the words we use. 38% of what people notice is the tone of voice we use. And 55% of all language consists of body language. Um, so it's hugely important that when we are in a position of facilitating a group of people that were conscious, conscious of the message our body is sending. If we're sitting there with our arms crossed or we're drumming our fingers on the table or we're looking all around the room, not making eye contact or whatever, we're clearly sending a message to the people in that group. So we have to be aware of the messages our body is sending to people because our level of confidence is going to be displayed through our body language. And our credibility is going to be linked to our confidence. So how you handle yourself is going to be key to others' perception of you. It's so important. Um, we do this little um, thing, and I'm, I'm just going to do this with you guys because there's a lot tied up in this whole communication thing. Um, and I'm just going to do this with you. I'm going to quote this sentence to you, and I'm going to quote it like six or seven different ways. And I'm going to enunciate every word differently. Okay. I never said she stole my money. 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 Oh, I never said she stole my money. I never said she stole my money. All right. So 
you it's the same sentence right but how i enunciate those words says a different meaning so the words how we say the words we say is important body language is important all this comes together in how we facilitate and the message we send to people okay so it's really super important when it comes to facilitation so what does credibility look like okay do i come into a facilitating situation expecting that people will trust me when you come into a facilitating situation is everybody going to trust you automatically yes or no do you expect anybody to trust you what do you guys think Will you repeat that, please? Be when careful. you start, I'm sorry. When you start facilitating a group, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be breaking up. When you start facilitating a group, do you expect people to trust you automatically? Tony shaking her head. Anybody else? No, Matt says no. Why do people trust you automatically? No, they have to get to know you. And they have you to get to know you, right. There's no, no basis of safety built there, is there? Right? So we have to make sure credibility looks like honesty, it looks like neutrality. It's being that expert among experts. It's supporting information with facts. It's inviting questioning and it's avoiding fixing people, okay? It's building that level of safety so people can start trusting. Because if we don't have that level of safety, people aren't gonna trust you, are they? No. And if you start trying to fix people, are they going to trust you? No. No, they're not going to trust you. All right. So, so we have to be honest. If you don't know the answer to a question, don't make something up. Somebody may know the answer, so trust the group wisdom. If somebody else knows the answer, let them share the answer. Be as free from bias as possible. Leave your stuff at the door. You don't have to know everything as the facilitator. Your ideas, your judgments, your baggage and your emotions should have no bearing on your facilitation of a group. Leave your stuff at the door because your stuff will affect your credibility. You need to leave it outside, okay? Support your information with facts and experience. As participants questions. You're not the sage on the stage that knows everything. You don't have to know everything. When I started facilitating, I thought I had to know everything. I thought I had to be the sage on the stage that had all the answers that knew everything. That took, you know, that was a lot of pressure. Part of being a facilitator is trusting the group and trusting the group wisdom because everybody comes to the table with wisdom. Understand and minimize stage fright. Know your topic, relax, practice with any equipment you use, 
stay focused, and it's important most of all to practice good self-care. And most importantly, be yourself. People are gonna know if you're faking it. Be who you are, be true to yourself. Shimmy and I have three vastly different ways of presenting material. And we work together well. Just be yourself and trust the process. So prepare, relax, rehearse, test equipment, know your audience, you know, greet people, reassure yourself. Nobody in your audience wants you to fail. Keep focused on your material. Use your emotions to benefit yourself. Know how to transition from point to point. Concentrate on what you're trying to convey, not yourself. Leave your baggage at the door and self-care, self-care, self-care. Take care of yourself. I'm Go ahead, curious, uh, oh, thanks, Kathy. Uh, just before we move on to trust, what are some other ways that uh, you out there in, uh, in Zoom land uh, prepare for facilitating a group or speaking or, or whatever? I mean, what are some of the other ways that, uh, that you've been able to achieve that? I'd like to hear some other examples. As I prepare for the, um, for, to facilitate a group, I also know that, um, like they were saying earlier, that I'm not the sage on the stage. I don't know everything. And I let the group kind of take over um, because the group is basically for the group. It's basically mm -hmm. for them to talk and for them to express. So as a facilitator, I'm just basically um, watching the door, keeping the snacks and stuff going, stuff like that, and letting the group take over itself. Yep. Can exactly. I ask another question? Brian, can I ask another question? Yes, definitely. What does self-care mean? Can I answer that? Sure. From, from my experience and my perception, self-care is when we um, make sure that we are taking care of our own emotions and um, even our physical needs. Um, and so that um, when we go into a group to facilitate, we're at our physical and emotional best, even if it means that we're going through a rough time, but we're coping and we've used our um, whatever skills we have to put those emotions aside for the benefit of the group. Um, I do that sometimes through um, mindfulness exercises or um, I make sure that my blood sugars are level. I'm a diabetic and when my diabetes is, you know, my sugars are off, my emotions are off. So, you know, it's that type of thing, making sure we're taking care of us. And that's I, true. And, and Kat, Kathy, we had a request to go to the prior screen for a minute, please. There we go. I did see um, Amanda uh, post in chat, definitely good self-care, um, enough sleep, eliminate distractions, practice authenticity. And I think that's important because sometimes when we don't take care of ourselves, we're not going to be any good to anybody else. And that's exactly what uh, Desiree said. So um, was somebody else going to speak up? If I may? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm getting a little bit confused here because there's some confliction on, you know, use your emotions to benefit you. But if we're leading a group, why am I using my emotions to benefit me? It's, and then I don't I, understand that leave the baggage at your door. That's been brought up like three or four times. What are we calling baggage that's being left at the door? What okay. is it about our life that we're not bringing to the discussion to assist okay. in the facilitation okay. Okay. of whichever group that we're doing? What, what I mean by leave 
leave your baggage at the door, that leave your biases at the door, your preconceived judgments, anything that would hinder you from effectively being a neutral uh, facilitator, um, your preconceived ideas, anything that would keep you from um, being neutral because you have to maintain a neutral balance. So if, if you can't- okay. Can, can we speak on that for a second? Is sure. it, This is like, we're, we're all certified peer support specialists, right? We all do group facilitation, correct? Right. All right. So we're, and the, the whole point of this is to learn how to do better group facilitating and become better peer support specialists, correct? So this leave your baggage at the door. What I'm feeling is another way, a better way of saying it is to leave your personal morality at the door and be open to accepting the individual that's in front of you and assisting them in accordance with their own morality, right? You know, this whole don't make judgments, you know, everything we do is about judgments, you know? So I'd, I'd have a hard time with that. But the, one of the points I wanna make is when we're on our journey of success, it is key for us to find somebody that validates us, right? So when we're, I just really think it's dangerous to tell me to not be me for a group of people who the thing they need most is to know that they can be you themselves. If I may. So, if yeah, I can. sure. I'm just having problems with yes. this whole check your moralness at the door. My name is William. And I'm a peer support specialist slash recovery coach here at Central City. I've been a recovery coach slash uh, peer since 2014. Um, I facilitate groups. I've done that over the entire time that um, I've been a peer recovery coach. And so what I have found over the years is that people want to know what I've been through in life people want to hear uh my story and, and and how i got clean people want to know um what did it take you know i i can't leave i don't believe in leaving my baggage at the door i believe in being a a, a hope shot for the people that i serve mm -hmm. um if not that if not for that then 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 they're missing um, a lot, you know, when it comes to the group. Now, the group is for the group. It's not for me. It's for me to share my story, to share how I done it, and let them take from that to help them. See, now, I, I, I agree with that very much, because what we've done now is we've allowed the group to become judgmental. We're not being judgmental about ourselves by merely presenting ourselves as who we are. We allow each person in the group to make a determination on how well our path connects to their path. Right. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. The, not, and I think a better way of relaying what they're trying to, to teach us here is that if we find somebody whose path is not our path for whatever myriad of reasons, we can't get upset with them. We can't tell them they're wrong. We can't tell them that that's not the right way, right? Because everything that we know is strictly based on our experiences and the little education we get and how it translates with our experience. So that whole leaving the baggage at the door, the non-judgmental, I think is, is just too harsh. I, we, when you're, when you're, answering a question or solving a problem you're not being judgmental you're just giving your genuineness and it will either work for a person or it won't work for a person i agree um, and there's nothing may, wrong with that may i say something please um i i facilitate a dbt refresher course for cmh 
but I also um, facilitate two support groups for NAMI. And um, they're very different, of course, in what the people in there need. Um, so when I think of the words, leave your baggage at the doorstep, um, it's not just the judgments, it's what you're, it's what you're going through, maybe. Um, I'm going to use an example um, that happened recently. My niece was murdered on July 4th, and um, I'm having a hard time with it, the grief-wise, but I can't take that into the groups. That is my personal baggage. That is what I'm having to deal with, and I can't go in there, and she was murdered with an assault weapon, so I can't go in there and have people who are um, and I know they are, uh, you know, hunters with, with the guns and stuff. I don't have a problem with that. You know, I'm a, I'm a Southern country girl. Um, so, but right now those are things that trigger me. So, but I have to leave that baggage at the doorstep. I can't take in that bias right now that every time somebody talks about you know, that type of thing, I'm going to break down and cry or rail against assault weapons or whatever. So to me, baggage is an individual definition, not necessarily a wide definition. I'm not sure. If, um, I, if, I'm, if I may, Laura, I got to respectfully disagree. I think it's okay. a much more powerful position if you can demonstrate to people who are on the earlier stages of the journey, that even later in the journey, life becomes unmanageable. Things happen in life. We're just as imperfect today as we were when we were addicts. And there's nothing wrong with that. There is nothing wrong with grieving the loss of a loved one. There's nothing wrong against being upset about the, the, the things that come to it. But what we try to teach, at least I'm, I try to teach, is that it's how we deal with it, okay? And I'm not perfect. I may be the group facilitator. I may be the authority figure that's supposed to know some things. But the truth is, I'm no different than you, brother. I have these things. You know, you don't want to talk like personal baggage. My son, just two weeks ago, a week and a half ago, was arrested with meth. He's looking at 20 years in prison, fourth habitual offender stuff you know, but to me, that's not baggage. That's a teaching point. How do I take this huge stressor and sit here and be like, okay, yeah, no, life is good. We keep going on. I, I demonstrate how I implement mindfulness in my life daily to stay on top of my sobriety. I demonstrate how I stay involved in learning. So I don't forget the linchpins of the things that made me successful. Okay. Because we have this tendency when we of complacency when we get to a safe place, when we plateau, when we when we think that we've had all the answers because that's how we got there, and we forget there's still more answers because we're still on the journey. You know, each one of us is never gonna have a perfect life. There's nobody that does. It's a lie. The best that we can do is embrace the life we have, embrace who we are, and find the best way to utilize ourselves for the ones that we love and things that we care about and for some of us that we come to the realization that no use of drugs no use of alcohol will ever facilitate me being the best person I can be you know I I work with what I my support group is for justice involved veterans with co-occurring addiction and PTSD problems and that being a very limited subculture of veterans we handle things a little bit differently. We talk about things a little bit differently. And there's other subcultures within the support groom realm and peer support specialists that just overhearing one of my supporters would be offended to the core, right? But each group, and this is where the no judgment comes in. I think each group of people who self-identify on that journey should be allowed to journey in the way that they want. You know, there's a whole group of people out there, you know, with this new hold harmless movement and stuff where it's almost as we're saying, yeah, you know what? 
relapses are going to happen. Relapses are going to happen. It's okay. Well, you know, back, and I know me, I don't know about everybody else, but back in my addict day, I took excuses to drink. Okay. And if I'm not secure in my sobriety, the expectation that I could relapse or should relapse sometimes gets in the back of my head and say, you know, Terry, you're six years sober now. If you were to go out and just get drunk for two, three days, you could call it a relapse. But that's my addiction speaking. That's not my intelligent, cognitive, sober Terry speaking. But that's my personality. I'm addicted personality. That's why I'm where I'm at. That's why I went through the things I went through because of who I am. So what I got to do is find the best way to harness me and channel it in a direction. And by in my group, sometimes I bring all this baggage in and all I do is say, look, this is me. This is how fucked up I am. But I've gotten to this level of what I call success with my sobriety, with my relationships, with my life, with my finances, doing these things. You have to find your own way. I can't help you. I can't make you. All I can do is tell you what worked for me and you can pull the pieces that you want. Just like when you go to the grocery store and you buy the things for the meal you're going to eat. You don't buy something from every single aisle in the store. Anyway, sorry, I got to, I'm on a rant. This is somebody else's class. And, but this, I, I, I'm hitting here because I want to find out how I can be a better group facilitator. And some of this stuff is just pretty much, I'm feeling it's telling me that my groups are worthless. And I guess that's probably why I'm rebelling so much. But on this whole, don't bring your judgments, don't bring your baggage, don't bring your morality into the group. When the fact of the matter is we're setting up peer support groups purely on the basis that we're trying to find birds of a feather that will flock together on the same journey. Okay. And if the sparrow doesn't want to fly with a cardinal, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay. The cardinal ain't a worse bird because it's red than the sparrow who is not. They're just on the same path to freedom to fly and live their life. I'm sorry. <laughs> Shut up. All right. Thank you very much for uh, your comments. And uh, I definitely did hear the back half of that. So I hear where you're coming from. We are back, or at least um, I'm back. I can't tell if Kathy's back yet or not, but um, we can move on with trust unless uh, somebody else. Oh, wait, I saw, I saw somebody I, wanted I to uh, say, have in, something to say. I so just go said, ahead. wanted to say something real quick, and I'm going to be like two minutes less. Yeah, go I ahead. I just want to say, I like both of their ideas, but I always call when I'm running a group is I look at the audience and try to judge my audience of where they're at. Yes. Meaning if they're if they are understanding that, you know, you need that roughness like he was talking about of saying, hey, this is what you need to do. This is what I do, blah, 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 blah. But they might not always need that right off the bat they might need to be a little bit softer and be like okay this is what these are your options out there and you just have to know your audience when you when you're presenting and i think that will also help build your trust with them yeah I, that's just, true that's just my opinion but uh, i mean you can take it like a grain of salt but you know i hope that helps I think it does because you do need to know your audience. And I think that that by knowing your audience and getting to know them, that does build trust. So I appreciate your comments as well, Matt. Uh, anybody else? I'm, I don't very often utilize Zoom from my phone, but our internet and phones are completely down at the office. So for now, we're just gonna have to do what we can do to uh, continue on unless um, something changes and our phone lines come back up. But, I have, a, I have a, um, something to um, add to that. Hi, my name is Tony. So for me, I think that baggage means a lot of different, has a lot of different meanings to different people. Um, what my definition of baggage might not be your definition of baggage. Um, also, sure. I, I run groups as well. And I think that some things that some parts of our story that we share at group is meant for group and some some things are just right. meant for us to share at our na tables um and they're not meant to share at groups um that's right the young lady was saying you know the baggage about 
um, the death and different things like that, stuff like that, I feel that I wouldn't go into group sharing that with them. That's something that I might want to share at an NA group or, or alcohol anonymous group, because I might feel like it could cause me to relapse or something. So mm -hmm. I just think that some things are meant to share part of your stories are meant to share in group and some things just not meant to share a group there for the tables. Thank you for letting me share. You're welcome, Tony. And uh, you really nailed it there that uh, some things you don't want to share in group just because you could end up uh, traumatizing somebody or divulging information that doesn't need to be divulged. So appreciate your input. So with all of this, we will move on to trust. And unfortunately, we can't uh, do anything regarding our slideshow at this point. But um, moving on with trust, it's a simple concept. I mean, it's, it's an easy word to say, but it can be difficult to gain it sometimes, especially when you're working with folks who have been burned so much in the past. And I'd be willing to uh, venture to guess that uh, probably 100% of us in this room right now have been burned in the past. So um, how do we help people find ways to trust? And we've heard some of them already in some of the examples uh, regarding credibility. Um, is it an easy process? It's not always easy to gain trust. Is the ability to trust an important part of the group process? I mean, what do you guys think? Is it important for the group to trust the facilitator or even trust each other? Yeah. And then how much does the concept of safety play into the ability to trust or not trust? Again, um, my name is William. Um, yes, William. And so trust plays a big part. You know, is when I open up group, I always share that, how important it is for us to be able to come together as a group and share our experiences with the knowing and the knowledge that it's not going to go outside of that room. Right. You know, I've, I've been I've been in a situation where uh, a young lady, if I may, share some information about somebody, and the somebody that she shared that information with, old lady, was in the group. And so when the group was over with and they went back out into the lobby, if I had not been there, there would have been a fight. You know, I mean, you know, you, 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 you come to group to be able to open up and be honest about where right. you're at and where your life is headed and what's going on in your life. And if you can't be honest and open up in group, then you're wasting your time even being there. And so it's real important that the members know that what they share in group stays in group. 100% agreed. Your group is confidential and it needs to stay that way because the people that we're working with in the group have all been burned before. They don't need to be burned again when they're trying to work on their issues. So uh, that's that's that was powerful. Thank you. All right. Um, anybody else with any um, anything to offer for trust before we move on to safety? But uh, how much how much does the concept of uh, safety play into the ability to trust or not trust? The more you identify with that person, the person's story is the talk, you will uh, open up more and it might be good for the two people. Yep. Yep. You, they will open up more in a safer environment. Yep. All right, anybody else before we move on? All right, so moving on to safety. Your greatest responsibility 
as a facilitator is to create a safe place for group members. How you do this will be a key in allowing participants to be able to share freely and openly. So question, what are some of the components of a safe place and how do we build that from the ground up? And whether you have facilitated before or not, um, I'd like to kind of hear how do you build a safe environment? I'm trying to keep up with the chat. Um, William again. Let's see here. Yeah, Amanda says one of the biggest benefits of the support group is the connection it provides and without trust that connection is at risk and less likely. I would agree. So the connection is important. So, okay, go ahead. I think that another uh, component of safety would be having a secure place to run your meeting. Um, here at Central City, we have, a, we have a place where we can close the door and, and our sharing and the things that we share are not heard, you know, throughout the floor. Right. You know, I think being 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 able to share, knowing that no one's outside listening to what you shared be. And I must admit, sometimes I get out of control because I'm very adamant about um, recovery. You sure. Know, um, I get loud. I'm boisterous. You know, um, I've always been like that, you know, and sometimes I get carried away. You know, but but being safe is part of the reason why our members here at Central City continue to come back and our groups are growing because they feel safe. That's the way it should be. We had a couple of more uh, comments in the chat. Um, Matt says, state the group rules at the start. That's always one of the first things that you want to do. Um, let's see, R. Spruce said the same thing, lay ground rules. Amanda agrees. And then uh, Kelly, uh, groups could be held. It says their house or the resource center. So you just want to make sure it is at a safe place where people can feel secure and confidential. Right. And uh, safety, the next bullet here would say safety includes ground rules, procedural rules, the physical environment, the mental as well as the emotional environment. So during the, uh, the group, you want to make sure that uh, you, you state in the uh, ground rules that um, there's no yelling at each other. I mean, that creates a hostile environment and that that doesn't do any good for anybody that just re traumatizes. And without safety, the group will not be effective for the members. I think so, um, so, I'll, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think also you have to um, immediately, you know, stop any talk that starts in the group that is inappropriate or that is not following the guidelines rather than let it go on and talk to the person afterwards. Then the rest of the group gets the idea, hey, you know, it is a safe place because they don't allow it to go on or act out. Just a thought. Nope, and that's, you, you nailed it. Just uh, you, you want the verbiage or the language to be um, safe for everybody or creating a, a safe and uh, tranquil environment. And the safety must be built from the ground up. Uh, many people will not come into the group automatically trusting you as the facilitator. And frankly, if that's one of your expectations, maybe you need to take a step back and rethink your position. You, get, you need to earn their trust or gain their trust. Um, it's not going to be automatically there for most people. For some, there might be a few, but um, most of us, again, have been burned. And we spend some time talking about ground rules and procedural rules, but why are ground rules important? And should the group members have any say in these ground rules? I mean, who's ultimately, who's, who should be responsible for setting these ground rules? Matt says yes. Um, 
I just wanted to say, um, basically, the ground rules should be set by the group as well as the facilitators. There may be right. something that the facilitators miss that the group um, will catch, and there's something that the group will catch that the uh, facilitators will miss. I think it should be a, co a collaboration of both parties. Uh, we have a group, uh, our group rules, our ground rules posted up on the wall where everybody can see them each day, every, um, every time they come into the group room. And um, sometimes we'll point to the rule, you know, okay, look at rule number seven, things like that when things get a little um, out of hand, more or less. You don't always have to tell people, you know, you can't do that, you can't do this. You can just say, re re remember the ground rules, people, remember the ground rules, and you just keep mm -hmm. the group moving and facilitate it that way. Yeah, you want to make sure that uh, you work together between everybody in, in the group. And uh, Dave agrees with Dennis, it should be done by the group. And so um, I guess we'll leave that point or that thought right there because that's exactly what we train everybody. It's gotta be a collaborative effort. So part of building safety in a group is building the guidelines with the group members. When the group members have a say in the rules of the group, they find a basis for safety and accountability. Safety is paramount importance to the members of the group. And again, many of, if not all participants will come with a trauma background. So having that safe place at a group is key. So um, you've just got to keep the environment safe. That's important. The facilitator needs to control the environment, but not be controlling of the, uh, the participants. Um, proper lighting, um, doors open or closed. Uh, some people get freaked out if the doors are closed. They feel trapped, and I can fully understand that one. Um, safety can also be about the little things like names. Is it okay if somebody is not comfortable at first sharing their name right away? Um, we've had discussions both for and against that, and I mean, what do you do in that situation if somebody is not comfortable yet? Um, to uh, give their name in a group. Does that affect trust at all? I'd like to hear a thought or two on that one because I've heard it both ways. And has anybody experienced I that? I don't think that that would affect trust. I would, well, I think that it would make it better for a person, you know, a person would trust you more just knowing that you care about their thoughts, their feelings, that you care that they don't want the door closed, you know, right? Um, versus you saying, well, the door is going to be closed. I don't know what to tell you. So I think that um, that helps to build trust, just putting people's feelings in place. Yep. You, and so, um, oh, go ahead, Dennis or William. So we have a, a couple members here that are kind of new to us. Um, and what you were just talking about really hit me hard. Um, young lady is really suffering from some deep-seated mental issues, um, real, real bad trust issues. You know, she was not comfortable with sharing her name when she um, first came to us. And this is a young lady that's in college. You know, but. Um, here lately, she's sharing her name. She had to, she had to get comfortable in the group with the people that show up in the group every week before she even started to sharing what she, why she's here. Even. And she's never had a drug problem, but she really enjoys these groups, and she shows up. No, so it happens. It's true. So vulnerability builds trust, and then trust builds the safety environment. And with that, are you there, Kathy? Uh, we cannot hear you. I think you're on mute. I can hear you through the door, but I can't hear you in the room.
So we're problem solve here really quick. All right, so we are going to go to plan C with dialogue, discussion, and debate. And uh, come on in, Shelly, she's going to do that one. Now I'm going to hand off my headset. Hello, everybody. Dialogue, discussion, and debate. In a support group, you could have all three. But dialogue is listening to people, speaking with people, sharing insight, generating different ideas from different people, reflection of what has been said, emergence of new thoughts, collaboration with others, exploration of ideas and thoughts, understanding, you're trying to build understanding and you believe that there's strength in all. With discussion, you're speaking, you're speaking to, you're focusing on differences. You could be adversarial. You could generate conflict. You're promoting quit thinking and lock in to thoughts and ideas. And with debate, you're assuming that you're correct. You're combative. It's about winning the point. Critical of others, critical of other things that other people are saying. Defensive of your own ideas and how they're presented. You're predatory, and that can be a weakness. And you're ratifying your position. Of these three, which do you think work best in a uh, support group? Dialogue, discussion, or debate? Discussion. Okay, why do you say that? Is it better? Yeah, that's better. Can be firm in a debate in a discussion. Yeah. Friendly, you have so the other people will get your point. See what I mean? Yeah. What do you think about identity? idea may uh, coming up with new ideas that that you can do too right but you have to listen to other people's ideas too okay just a sec Okay, we're going to move along. Thank you. Thank you for your thoughts. Okay. You're welcome. There are four rules for dialogue. The first one is listening. It's about coming together as a larger entity. Sometimes our minds are interrupting us as we try to listen. We can still our minds by acknowledging thoughts and deliberately making a choice to put them to the side. That clears the path to listen with your heart and your ears. And it also takes away from the need to reply. 
Listening is a choice that we make. By choosing to listen, we gift the other person our complete attention without needing to fix or intervene. How important do you guys think listening is? Really important. If you don't listen, how are you going to get to know the person? And how are you going to be? Right. Person? Some Ooh, people I'm need to talk to other people in order for them to make them feel better. Sometimes they share their stories and ideas and and ask for um, opinions and stuff like that from other people. Yes, very true. It also helps helps you to be able to assist the person better and, and know what their needs are. Right. And how good does it feel to know that you're being listened to? Oh, really well. Yeah. The next rule is respect. And respect is not a passive act. The original meaning of the word respect is to look again. The most ancient meaning is to observe. It involves a sense of honoring or defer deferring to the other person. And when I respect, I accept that I can learn from you. And respecting people's differences means that I accept you as you are without trying to change or fix you or even defend my position. It does not depend on agreement on perspectives or ideologies. Who deserves our respect? Our coworkers, our family. What about group members? Oh, group members, sorry, and uh, friends and roommates. Some of them, um, we have to respect their boundaries and stuff too. Right. Anyone that you would come in contact with, I would say. What if they don't respect you? You'll respect them. Maybe they'll learn from you. Good idea. I think respect I think is to respect yeah. others and to uh, have the peers that are the consumers in, in uh, the STEP program to learn how to respect the peer mentors. Mm -hmm. The next rule is called suspending. And in a dialogue, we have choices to make. When someone begins to speak, our first choice could be that of listening without forming an opinion. If we choose to form an opinion, our listening may not be as effective because our minds are occupied with coming up with either an agreement or a rebuttal to what the other person is saying. And the natural outgrowth of this is to speak thoughts of our minds. So we want to suspend our own judgment and our own need to respond and allow the other person to speak. Do you guys agree with that? Yes. Okay. Go on. And the final rule is voicing and that's the ability to be true to your true to yourself and be able to voice your thoughts and opinions and that needs to be encouraged being authentic means that you're able to voice your thoughts and questions in a safe place without fear of reprisal or ridicule being authentic calls for us to be the honest to be honest and vulnerable with ourselves and with others. So it is important to voice your thoughts and opinions. And it's important <coughs> that
that you encourage others to voice their thoughts and opinions. I think we're ready to move on. Thank you, Shelley. And again, I uh, sincerely um, ask everybody's forgiveness for us having to deal with these less than ideal conditions due to our internet and phone still being out. But uh, we've got about uh, 10 minutes left. So I'm gonna call Kathy Bennett um, back into the uh, or into my office and we are going to go over um the uh, trauma part of uh, support groups because we need to understand that trauma is one of the most critical parts of uh, our lives whenever we're dealing with our mental health conditions um with trauma i mean the secret no one tells you about this work is that healing is happening all the time. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kathy. Hi, everybody. Sorry about the problems that we're having. Technology is our friend, right? So do you guys think trauma manifests itself in a group setting? Yeah, I think it does. Do you think people get traumatized? And what happens when people get traumatized? Um, do, you, do you as a facilitator get traumatized? Yeah, people get shut down. What happens when you and a facilitator gets traumatized? They don't talk. When the facilitator gets traumatized, um, it's kind of, you have to find a place to recollect yourself. You have to, you have to find a place to recollect yourself so you are able to, to, to move on, you know. You can't, yes. you can't stay there and stand there in front of 10 people and, 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 and be stuck and lost for words. It's, right. it's not a good look, you know, so you have to be able to find that place where you can you can pull yourself back together right as possible right it, dave said it affects everyone in the group and it it does um so triggers look different for everyone in the group and and i've uh, done some research into what's called a trigger cycle and it's really kind of fascinating um, Dr. Kathy O'Bears has, and this is, if you if you want this um, PowerPoint, we'll be happy to get this out to you. But Dr. Kathy O'Bears has done this thing called a trigger cycle. And because when triggers happen, they happen really, really quickly for people. And they're really hard to figure out. And so when I found this trigger cycle, it was like, oh my God, this is what happens to folks. So the trigger event happens. Um, and what she's done is she's broken this out into, this is what happens. So the trigger event happens. And so that's the center event. And what happens is the, the event happens. And then seven things happen in like a split second, okay? Yeah, we'll make sure, I will make sure that you, we'll put this email in the chat so you guys, or we'll put this PowerPoint in the chat so you guys can have this one anyway. Um, so what happens when the trigger event happens, it, it triggers something in us in our roots um, because when trauma settles in our genetics and um, it affects us at our very root core okay so when we're triggered it sets us off at our very root core and then we see that event happening through a lens okay 
And then when we see that happening, it affects our cognitive, our emotional, and our physical health. And then we form an intention based on how that affects our cognitive, emotional, and physical health. And with that intention, we form a reaction. And then we are re-triggered based on that reaction. All this happens in a split second based on that re-triggering event. Does that make sense to you guys? So it all happens in a split second. Go to the next slide, would you? So what Dr. Kathy O'Bears has done is she's broken it down. So at that very first rooting of that triggering event, if we can change that and rather than having that root happen, we can unroot it. I, and she's broken this down. We can unroot at that first event. Then we can, if we don't catch it there, we can change how we look at that. Um, look at it through a different lens. And that if we can't look at it through a different lens, then maybe we can change how our body reacts to it. We can make a different meaning to the. Um, triggering event we can change how we react to it we can change make a different reaction to it and then we can recenter we can break that triggering event and make a different meaning to it so it's a non-triggering event it's a Really fascinating, if you look up Dr. Kathy O'Bear's trigger cycle on Google, it really can change how people look at trigger cycles and change how you react to trigger cycles. Um, and take the terror out of those trigger cycles and really make a new meaning out of them. And so that might be something, you know, if you're dealing with trigger cycles in your group, maybe have a group session on, you know, let's look at this and how can we change those into something that's not as terrifying because trigger cycles can be really terrifying for a lot of people and how can we change that so it's not as terrifying. And that's just a little quickie on trigger cycles. Um, so we want to make sure that we get you out of here on time. Um, we've given you a lot of information, and I'm going to give this back to Brian. Thank you, Kathy. And uh, we have given you a lot of information, not as much as we would have liked because of our uh, technical difficulties. But um, and I don't think I can put this PowerPoint in chat because I'm using my phone and the PowerPoint is on the computer. However, what I will do is I will give you my email address and I would be more than happy to send you the uh, copy of the PowerPoint um, as soon as our phones and computers are back online. Uh, my email address is B R W E L L W O O D at yahoo.com. And I also saw a message from uh, my peers um, from, uh, from the technical assistance people here that they can also send it out. So we will email that to, um, to the, uh, the, the people in charge of the uh, conference and be able to get that sent out to anybody who's interested. So I wanna thank everybody for sticking through us or sticking through this with us. Um, yeah, nothing more frustrating than having technical difficulties of this magnitude during a presentation. And also, um, if you're interested in us coming and doing something in person, um, a, uh, it's like four or five hour um, technical training for support group facilitations, um, you can give us a call. Um, our phone number 
and to write this down if you're interested in the training, if you've got a group, we can do it through Zoom or in person. Our number is 1-800-831-8035. And uh, once again, 1-800-831-8035.